Hello, my name is Giri Bernstein and I am a data and AI specialist with Microsoft Canada. Today I'll be talking to you about the path to data architecture. I'll start by going over a little bit of my personal journey that led me into data architecture and then I'll talk about some tips and tricks and some other roles in the world of data that you could build your career towards if data architecture is not necessarily the flavor that appeals to you the most. So I'll get started with a little bit of my background and how I got to where I am right now. So I started as a software development, started my career as a software developer. And the first role that I had was a front end developer, which means I was part of a team that worked on the actual user interface of an information technology system. And from that role, I found myself going through several different roles. The first job that I had was with the IDF and the way that we worked there, every two years you would transition to a different role. Uh, even if you were very good at your role, the belief was that this is a good way to learn and grow. And so in the eight years that I worked there, I had the opportunity to go from front-end development to integration development, to infrastructure, to database administration. I had a chance to try business analysis a little bit, be a project manager for a short time and get some uh, certification and training for each one of these different roles. And a big part of my job was also designing and vetting out architecture for the systems we were building. But I did not have necessarily the role of an architect defined as my job description, if you will. After that first job, I found myself continuing in the database administration field and data development, um, and I branched into data warehousing. And through, through several years after that job, I had a chance to meet different patterns and different architectures. And then the next position uh, that I found myself in was in the business intelligence space as a business intelligence architect, which is a type of data architect, if you will. I find that those different roles and the different exposures that I had really helped me shape into the role of an architect. And I did work with a lot of other architects in the last 10 years of my career. So I see that this is a very common pattern where most of the people that are in an architect position have a pretty diversified background and have tried and touched different aspects of data systems that give them the necessary breadth of perspective on one hand, but enough depth because they have done hands-on uh, work in each one of those different areas so that they have a good enough foundation to stand on, to ask the right questions, to go through um, the different intricacies or the different components of architecting and designing a solution. And I really think this is at the heart of what being an architect is. You need a combination of technical depth because it is definitely a technical leader role being an architect, but also breadth of different areas and perspective because building an architecture means you are designing the bigger picture of what the system will be like, what different tools are there in it, what different components and how they all speak to each other. And for you to be able to draw that kind of picture, you need to be familiar with those different components to a degree. Now, the challenge with that is if you are in earlier days of your career, or maybe you have a few years of experience already, and you're asking the question of how can I become an architect, it's a bit tricky to say, okay, let's just make sure that you do something different every year for the past for the next few years until you have that breadth, right? Your career doesn't always follow that type of path, but on the flip side, you might want to direct it in that direction. So I would say a first good step to think about is what are data systems built of and what are those different areas that you need to be familiar with? Then you can identify gaps in your own personal experience and understanding and start working towards closing these gaps by actively getting into those areas where you have a less deep knowledge from a technical perspective. So I would say in today's in, in the modern data space, which is um, a little more diverse and has different types of systems um, than I would say when I started my career about 20 years ago, that you could look at the different types of systems out there and ask yourself, do you have a background or do you need to complete some knowledge in the different types of systems? And when we think about data systems, uh, information systems, 
data architect would typically fall into one of two big kind of bucket areas. There is uh, operational data and analytical data uh, that also translate into what we used to call uh, OLTP, online transactional processing, versus OLAP, OLAP, online analytical processing. So it's a question of are we creating the data or are we analyzing the data? And the reality of systems until today is that they're typically very much directed at doing one or the other, and those are different areas of expertise. So operational systems, the ones that create the data, are more application-centric. If you think about the type of background that you need to have, you'd like to have background in things like programming um, and user interface design and user experience. If you're thinking about the analytical system, the type of components that build up these systems, and I would say that probably more of the, data, the classic data architects deal with the analytical system, then the big block components that these systems have are data preparation, data analysis, and data presentation. And those three different areas, they all have different career paths within them, but as an architect, you need to have somewhat of familiarity with all of them. And I do want to talk about them a little bit. I won't get into too much detail, but just to give a bit of a feel where they all play the part, right? So when I say data preparation, when you think about analysis, in today's world, in, in data analysis, there are a lot of different patterns on how you would acquire, analyze, and present data. But typically, there is an acquisition or preparation phase because the data is not born in the same way that you would want to consume it for analysis. So there is this preparation or wrangling or loading of data. There's a lot of different terminologies for it, but in the end, it is the process of getting data from where, where it was born to where it can be analyzed. And sometimes it is just moving data from one place to another. But more typically, it means altering the data so it's more consumable. It could be cleansing the data. It could be rebuilding it in a way that is more, um, that makes more sense from a business perspective, that is easier to read, maybe labeling it in a clearer way. Those kind of transformations in the data or changes in the data is what data preparation is about. And that whole area is what typically sits under the umbrella of, of data engineering as we call it. And there are a lot of different tools and processes and, and jobs, if you will, career paths around that process of acquiring the data and pre preparing it so that it could be consumed. So that would be kind of bucket one. Bucket two is what I call data analysis. Once the data has been prepared, there is the, the job of analyzing it. And often this is less of a programmer's job, but more of a data analyst job. And you would think that you know, skills that are useful in this field is understanding the data, understanding statistics, how to work with data. And there's a whole variety of how deep would you go in analyzing your data. And it starts from understanding what does the data tell us about what there is there today. Even, you know, they say that you can tell all kinds of different stories with the da same data if you know what story you want to tell. But understanding the data to the point where you tell the right story or where you know how to answer the right question for the business, even the definition of what is the right data to answer this question is sometimes not trivial. Even understanding the business meaning of one entity or another can completely change the answer to a question based on data. So understanding that and coming up with how do we get those answers out of the questions that business people are asking. This is what data analysis is about. And at some levels, it is more straightforward and a business stakeholder can better explain or better answer your questions about how to define the data that needs to be used to answer their question. And sometimes it's more exploratory, more of a scientific method kind of approach to analysis, what we like to call data science, which is take the data that is maybe not as prepared more raw, if you will, analyze it and come up with what patterns come out of it or what stories come out of it that maybe we didn't anticipate right off the bat and what new stories does it tell us about the meaning of this data. And all of these kind of sit under that bucket of analyzing the data once it's been 
um, brought in and prepared. And then the last piece is that serving of the data, which could be everything from reporting to dashboard to visualizations. And it's pretty wide field because there are so many things that you can do nowadays. The tools have progressed so much over the past 10 years or so, and they keep progressing all the time. But with that variety of different ways to serve data comes complexity. How do you choose the right graph that tells the story? How do you balance between wanting to give a very, um, very clear message and using all those cool new visualization tools? When is an animation useful? When do you want to see, for example, the animation of time lapse? In some cases, it's very useful. In other cases, it's a gadget that creates noise. So there's a lot of business analysis there and really understanding what would be useful versus what would be cool, which to a degree to circle back to the question of data architecture, when you choose an architecture and when you choose tools for an architecture, that question comes up too. What would be useful versus the school technology that you want to try? But I'm digressing. So those different areas, as a data architect, you want to have some familiarity with each one of them with how data is born, with how data is brought into analysis systems, with how data is being explored and analyzed, served and visualized. You want all of these different areas to some degree to be a well-rounded data professional in general, and for sure, if you want to be a data architect. The other thing I want to highlight is because a data architect is it is a very technical role. It is a senior technical role, but it is very technical. You need to have the technological background to stand on when you build your architecture. And to a degree, it means you need to be able to roll up your sleeve and solve a problem. But even when you're not doing that, in order to know what are the right questions to ask or what are the considerations that you need to take into account when you're working on a specific problem, you really want to have that background and exposure because that's what's going to make you ask the right questions. And when I say that background and exposure, then let's say we're talking about data architecture and we can ask ourselves, what are those different areas that make up a data system? And then out of these areas, for each one of them, you probably want to have more than one technology in your back pocket to some degree. You don't need to be an expert on every single technology that you had exposure to, but I would say, some hands-on experience is super useful, will help you really have the depth on which to stand when you ask your questions or when you make your considerations. And the thing with learning technology is that every type of technology, you learn the first one, there's a lot of investment there because you're together with the technology, you're learning all the principles that this technology stands on. Then you learn the second one and it's still quite a bit of an investment because Every th all the principles that you learned were very much tuned to the first one that you picked. So in the second one, you're breaking some of those connections and starting to compare the two and understanding the principles in a more profound way and the differences between the two technologies. If you then go and pick up a third, that's going to be really easy at that point because there are so many similarities and you wind up more closing the gaps or finding out the little bits that are maybe not exactly uh, the same or conceptually a little bit different, but it's 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 a very accelerated learning path. And that acceleration shows you that you've now really digested and are able to make use of the principles that you picked up with the first two. So I would say two is kind of your threshold for every type of technology that is a part of what you need to know as an architect. So if I'm thinking about, you know, a data architect, then you probably want to know two programming languages. You probably want to know two databases. You probably want to know two NoSQL platforms. You probably want to know at least two data ingestion tools or ETL tools. So every type of solutions that it, that is in that space of what you're going to be building, you probably want to have at least some exposure to the two. And it could be that one you really went into depth with, right? Your first programming language, you built a lot in, you really got yourself into all the details and you're really, really good, you're an expert in that. And then the second one, maybe you learn it to some degree, but not quite as much. 
enough to feel comfortable in, enough to feel like if you pick up a third one now, it's just going to be comparing notes more than anything, right? So you don't have to get quite as deep with every single technology, but yes, you want more than one so that you can differentiate what's unique to the specific technology that you learned from what are the principles that you want to take on. I do have one example where this really worked out very well for me. When I was a DBA, I had pretty good deep exposure to two database engines at that point in my career. One was Oracle and the other was Microsoft SQL Server. And so when I learned Oracle, that was an ongoing journey for me, first as a developer, and then I went through the professional training as a DBA. So that was a pretty that was a pretty steep learning curve altogether. And it was over the course of a few years that I became an expert on that database engine. SQL Server, I kind of learned on the go. I still, it took me quite a few months to get to a proficiency level, especially because I didn't really dedicate time to learning it, it was on the job. But still, there were a lot of differences. And then a few years into working with both of these engines, we wound up looking at a new data warehouse solution for the company I worked at at the time. A part of why we were looking at a new data warehouse solution and a new technology is because we've grown beyond the capacity of what the SQL Server infrastructure that we had at the time could carry. And we were looking at what's called an MPP or a massive parallel processing database engine. Those are used for bigger amounts of data and the ability to process them. And the principle behind them is that instead of having a single server with a single database on it, there are a lot of servers that are all connected together in a massively parallel. So when I'm saying massive parallel, we're not talking two or four, we're talking about a hundred or more. A cluster of these servers that are all connected and when you interact with them as a developer, they are presenting like it's one database, but behind that you have all that parallel power. Now, of course, I'm saying it's presenting like it's one database, but it's not that straightforward. There are some nuances to MPP databases in comparison to traditional single node databases. When we were looking at different technologies for that MPP transition at the time, there weren't a lot of players in the market. This is quite a while ago. There are, few, there are a lot more today. But out of the players we looked at, we wound up choosing one that was based on another database engine that I wasn't familiar with at the time, which is PostgreSQL. So I had to pick up PostgreSQL and I had to add in the understanding of what are the differences between it being an MPP and a regular database. For example, a very important principle when you're designing an MPP system is how you split the data between those hundred or so nodes, right? So for me, I was a little worried because I knew that now I have to pick up another database engine and all the differences and nuances, plus this very new concept that I've never dealt with before of massive parallel systems. But what I found is that the differences between Postgres and the other two databases that I was proficient in were actually almost negligible. Yes, there was a bit of a learning curve, but it wasn't a big deal. I saw more similarities than I saw differences. And so I picked it up much faster than I picked up the previous two. And I could focus on the differences of the MPP system. And even that didn't take quite as long because it's not like I was learning the whole thing from scratch. I was learning the differences again between the systems I was familiar with and this system that had a, a list of specific issues or principles that I had to think about now that had to do with the fact that it's massively parallel. So this is a good example of having that foundation puts you in a place where when you need to catch up, it's a reasonable catch up and not this crazy mountain to climb right now. I mentioned before that having this kind of foundation to stand on helps you ask the right questions. And I wanted to clarify a little bit what I mean by that. When you're architecting a solution or when you're solutioning, if you will, very often you're having a conversation with a client and you're trying to translate business requirements into technical functional requirements and then understand what type of solution will serve them. 
In today's world, with the tools that we have, you can pretty much do whatever you can imagine. But everything comes with a certain price tag on it. And sometimes it's the cost of the tool that can do what you're thinking about. Sometimes it's just going to take more time to develop. Sometimes the result will be more complex. So the cost of maintaining and operating the system, which is more complex, will be higher. And that cost, that overall cost compu computation is sometimes very difficult to calculate, right? How can you um, account for how many people will you need to maintain the system? And if you've used a technology that is not that common, now you need to find people that know the technology or train them up on the technology. Um, and what exactly is the difference in hours? If you've complicated your system by 20%, does it mean that you need 20% more personnel to support it? Not necessarily, right? Maybe you complicated it enough so that it recovers itself whenever there is an issue and now you actually need less people. So it can be a pretty, I guess, complicated question sometimes. What is the implication of a certain solution? And we don't always have that answer, but we need to have enough awareness so that when a question comes up that would mean a steeper cost, we can communicate that clearly and then make a decision. A very classic example in the world of data or data analysis to be more specific is the question of latency. So most of the analytical data systems are usually based on different copies of the data from where the data is born. Let's say you have an ERP system in your organization, data gets entered into the ERP system your analytics system will typically not go straight to the ERP system to fetch data for analytics. It's going to copy the data aside. There are all kinds of different solutions to do that, but most of the systems still do that. And then the question is, when does the data get copied? Is it immediate or is there a certain form of latency? And in a lot of places, traditionally, there's been quite a bit of latency and traditional business intelligence systems, it's typically a nightly process. And in a lot of businesses, that's tolerable, but in other businesses, it isn't. And so this is a very typical question that comes up when we talk about the design or the architecture of a data system is, what is the desired latency? And I can say that in my years as a BI consultant, pretty much every client I had a conversation with started with saying, we want real time data, which means, zero latency or as close to zero as possible. Can we do that? Absolutely. But how much is it going to cost? And again, when I'm saying how much is it going to cost, it's not a question only of how much is it going to cost to build it, but how much is it going to cost to run it, right? So our, our um, regular escape from this question is saying, well, it's not about real time. It's about right time. And that's true, it is about right now. But really what it boils down to is, what are you trying to do? Why are you asking for the data to be in real time? And this is, this is a good question to ask, but typically you're not going to get a simple answer. And it's not because your, uh, your client or your business stakeholder doesn't want to answer. It's because sometimes they don't necessarily know, not in terms that would help you come up with different solutions. You are the professional in the field of data, so you can come up with suggestions that maybe they wouldn't think about. But for that, you need to understand what they're trying to do. What is the pain point? What are they trying to solve? If you will, it's a little similar to going to the doctor and saying which medicine you need versus going to the doctor and describing how you feel for the doctor to check what's wrong with you, right? So I have an example of a client that we had that said that they wanted near real time uh, analytics. So we would have to keep the, the data warehouse refreshed in near real time. And we started down the conversation of what are we actually trying to solve? And throughout that conversation, we, we reached two very interesting conclusions. So the first conclusion was when they said near real time, a window of 30 minutes would have been enough for them. That was the guarantee that they wanted to make to the business. But it was important that it would be guaranteed. And the reason for that is that they had a solution previously that was supposed to be refreshed every 30 minutes. And most of the time it would, but sometimes it didn't. And the users never knew and they couldn't trust the data. And so the, the real problem there was not time. The real problem 
was trust. And as we understood that, we talked about what can we do to recover the trust. And here's the thing. I've worked on mission critical systems. No system is 100% perfect. So when you talk about an issue of trust, it's very problematic to say we guarantee that this will never ever fail you again, right? And the cost behind we guarantee that it will never ever fail you again might be that you need to stand up the system more than once so that you'd have a backup uh, copy, right? How expensive is that? So the important piece was understanding that our problem is trust and then asking ourselves creatively, what can we do to help with the trust problem? So the first thing that we did is we added the new feature to the solution. We added a as of date field that would trickle down all the way from the source to the destination and was presented in all the reports. And so now we said that the guarantee is that it, it will run in less than 30 minutes. Your data will be 30 minutes fresh, but also that you know for sure when it was refreshed for. So you don't have to assume that it refreshes every 30 minutes. You can see when it was last refreshed. And that as of date made a big difference in the ability of people to trust the system because they knew that if it takes more than 30 minutes, they will know. It's not like they would have to trust the numbers in their reports and then find out that they weren't true. And the other interesting thing that came out of that was the question of, okay, let's say we have 50 data items or data entities in the system and one row didn't refresh through. What do you want us to put in the as of date? And I'll save you what was essentially a week of, of debates with the business and understanding what would be the proper behavior but in the end, the requirement that we all came together around was a pretty unique requirement of it has to be all or nothing. And the date will be the date of the last time that all of it was updated. So if there is one row in the millions of records that came in that's causing a problem, everything needs to be reverted to the way that it was before the last run. And the date needs to be the date before the last run. This is a pretty unique request in the world of data warehousing. But because we really dove into the question of why 30 minutes, why is this such a big deal? What are we trying to accomplish? We understood that really more than the latency, it comes down to, can I trust the data? And is the data complete? And the nature of the data within that data warehouse solution was that no one piece was more valuable than another. It had to be all or nothing. So we designed the solution in a way that would support that rather than your traditional data warehousing solution that would typically pass through as much data as possible. Asking these kind of questions is what makes a difference. And I think it really takes mileage more than anything to come up with these questions. Mileage and an openness to ask and to understand what are people looking for. In my mind, being that architect is being the technical leader of the team. So you need the mileage, you need the different technologies, you need to have enough experience to feel comfortable and enough, I guess, drive to still roll up your sleeves and code with the team and help them with everything. You need to understand the landscape of data and you need to be fairly technical. So I 100% can appreciate that it's not for everybody. But if you are interested in data, and if you're interested in it in a more holistic way, and you're pursuing a career in data that doesn't start from being a developer or for being very technical, there are a few other paths that I would consider could be very relevant. And the first one that I'm thinking about is more of a business analysis. That whole story of the 30 minutes, that was not a technical question. The technical team came up with, let's try to understand this. But this is what business analysis is about. Understanding what we're trying to accomplish from a business perspective. What is the client trying to do? And then helping them through creative thinking of different ways to implement the solution that would serve that business functionality. Versus talking about technical tools what are we trying to accomplish? So business analysis is a great path to go down. If this is something that you can connect to, if you think you have that kind of creative problem thinking 
um, problem-solving thinking and you feel comfortable enough working with business stakeholders, that would be a good place to go. Another interesting option is what I would probably put under the umbrella of client enablement. When we talk about data systems, there are quite a few peripheral roles around the technical team that help the success of the project that are critical. And part of it, you could think about as support roles, and part of it is change management, and part of it is what we call democratizing the data. Because in today's world, the solutions are such that there is a lot of self-service and people can get their hands on the data and get creative. But that also means that there's a lot of teaching around how to use these tools, how to analyze data, what does the data mean, the governance around the data and so on. So there are a lot of different career paths in these areas that you don't necessarily need to have the same level of technical depth on. You do need to understand the world of data, I'm not gonna lie, right? Um, but it is it can be a different entry point. And especially if you currently have a different career in the business world and you have that business acumen or background or experience to bring in, that could be a great entry point into the world of data that doesn't get rid of all your experience into a junior developer role. Another option to consider would be a data engineering specific skills. In data engineering today, there are a lot of skills that you could learn and quickly get started with without having a very deep programming background, such as data pipelines, ETL. So there are different areas where you can learn, or analytics, uh, visualization, where you can learn the tools and start implementing on a technical level uh, without diving very, very deep into programming and background of, of technical systems, and then see where your career really takes you from there more towards the business or more towards the technical that could take you into architecture. I do believe that to be successful in data architecture, you will need to have that hands-on experience in the different aspects to, to one degree or another. So definitely is something that I would pursue if, if you like that, if you enjoy the technical part of it, if you enjoy learning new technologies, if you enjoy cracking these kind of problems, then by all means pursue an architect role. If not, that's going to be a pretty punishing road to go through to get to the uh, architect role in the end of it. So if you are interested to venture into this world of, of data and you're not in it already, I did want to kind of throw as, as finishing thoughts, some ideas on how you could get started if you're interested. So there's some of the obvious tools of the trade out there that could be worth looking into. And it's not a huge commitment in terms of learning. You could get your hands, dip, dip your hands a little bit into it and, and, and get exposure. And you could start with things like ana analytics in Excel, pivot tables and functionality. Excel is one of the most basic and ubiquitous tools out there that are used for uh, analytics. Um, so definitely being an Excel um, expert is a good place to start. SQL language or SQL, if you look for it, there's a lot of free training out there. And this is the language that is used to query relational databases or databases organized in tables. It's kind of a basic get into data language. So this is no matter which role you're going to play, knowing SQL will be useful. And it's also a good way to feel, are you getting a kick out of it or it doesn't feel kind of eh, right? So I would say SQL is definitely a very good starting point. Absolutely go and learn SQL. Um, you can pick up some of the front end tools. Most of them have free training uh, that you can take online. And most of them you have a free version that you can download get in some, some free data sets and start playing with them and see how you feel about it and also build a bit of a portfolio for you yourself that can help you break into the business. Um, the two tools that are kind of the leaders in the market right now are Power BI and Tableau, but there's definitely others out there. And like I said, you probably want to have two on your belt. So pick one, um, learn it, feel comfortable with it, then pick the other one, play with it a little bit. Maybe try to build the same thing in both get yourself a bit of an opinion on what you think about those two different technologies. And then if you're a little more committed, I would say that the language that is undeniably the language of data science nowadays, as of November, 2020 is Python. So that would be a good, 
language to pick up, learn, and then there's a lot of free training online, and some of that training is very focused on data science. So you can pick up a couple of data science exercises and try it out and see how you feel about it. So those are a couple of good places to start your journey into data engineering, data analysis, data presentation, and eventually into architecture. So I did want to wrap it up and say, you know, I love my current role. It's um, it's a bit of an interesting different role. I'm no longer a data architect. Being a specialist in Microsoft is a form of a technical sales role. I brought all my technical background into this role and decided to, si to try something completely different. And I think really that's the heart of it. To be a good architect, you need to want to learn and to grow and to be curious and if that's who you are and if data appeals to you, then by all means, try it out, see where it takes you. Thank you very much.